Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiator, and Scott Brown from Ox America. Um, so, uh, Scott's over here at the moment, he's going to be teaching at Fight Camp, as he does most years, really, don't you? Yeah, yeah it's a pretty much annual thing that Scott comes over and hangs out with me and uh, then comes to Fight Camp. And um, so, what we're talking about in this video is what I would call I-33, what he would call... O-33 now. O-33, <laughs> what? You don't know this? No. Uh, so it, so yeah, I was expecting him to say 133. <laughs> so just to explain, for any of you who's just tuned into this and you like, what are these guys talking about? In their, in the sh an American and a British guy in a shed talking about some numbers. So, so what I-33 is a, is a, a catalogue, uh, is a, a, essentially a library reference number. Okay, the I is the Roman numeral I or one in, in Latin uh, counting, and uh, it's a source on sword and buckler fencing, the earliest surviving European fencing source that we know of. Um, and it's on the use of the sword and buckler, and it's kept by the Royal Armouries in Leeds, although the actual source itself is not British, it's um, Southern German, I think, is the current theory. But anyway, German, let's say. Um, so, why? What do you mean by O thirty three? What? Okay, so um, it, as you know, it was catalogued as I thirty three or one thirty three for many years, but they've recently rebound and cleaned up the manuscript, and it's been moved to a different shelf. <laughs> so now it's, that's uh, crazy. Yeah, yeah, it was wonderful. Um, Stuart, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to forget his name right now. Yeah. Uh, but up there, made a video of it and talking about it. And so, I like to stay current. <laughs> um, it'll be hard to get people to change from calling it 133, uh, but the, the manuscript has a ton of names. The Tower Fresh book, which was where it was originally refound. At the Tower of London. At the Tower of London. Um, sometimes called the Volpurgis Fresh book from the... Because the woman character in it is... On the final play, Supposedly yeah. Volpurga. Well, she's titled as Volpurga. Okay. Uh, which Volpurga that is, is open for debate, of course. Um, uh, sometimes it's called... Uh, oh, I forget some of the other names off the top of my head. But. So that's an interesting point, actually. And I'll just jump in there before we go into talking a little bit more about the source. And, and, and you'll notice Scott's holding a buckler, actually, from his own uh, company, originally Hema Supplies. They're not available at the moment, but hopefully will be again well, one day. They're in the works. Um, but anyway, very nice bucklers. Mine's a bit rusty. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> but um, it's a sword and buckler source. But what's interesting is not only is it a sword and buckler source, and it's the earliest European fencing treaties that we have, but also it's incredibly uh, detailed. It's got a lot of plays, but it's got a, a female, a woman fencer in it um, called Valperga. And there's some debate about whether that's supposed to be representative of a saint, I think, Saint Valperga, or, um, or whether it's an actual um, girl fencer. Uh, woman fencer we don't know but anyway we'll leave that topic but it's really just so that you guys if you didn't know that now know that that the earliest european fencing book has a woman in which is interesting because a lot of people make bizarre comments about um women in historical sword play obviously today no issue but but kind of like there you go the earliest european fencing source has a woman in it important fact to know okay but so I-33, I'm going to, I've called it I-33 all my life. I'm going to keep calling it I-33. Um, I-33, what is it? Like, is it, it, it's not a manual, is it? And I think that's where it's, diff it's important to talk about the difference between what's a treatise, what's a manual, but also what's this. What is it? Well, so technically this is a manuscript because it was done by hand and not printed. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's a lot of debate on whether it shows a codified system or a complete system. Uh, well, I think the notion of a complete system is farcical in pretty much any... Uh, is it ever art. possible to put a complete system Correct. in a book, you know, in a few pages of manuscript? Um, but I do feel it's rather undeniable to suggest that it's not a codified system uh, in the sense that there is an underlying structure and uh, particularly in the case of this, it, this is an extremely sophisticated manuscript, even by much later standards, yeah. and I'll go into that in a moment. Um, <clears throat> it has a, a clear pedagogical structure to it. It has a, a clear uh, sequence of, of instruction, not necessarily a, a clear sequence of how to train someone, but a clear sequence of thought processes. Um, uh, it's very analytical in its 
and it's self-referential. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's a, it's a very sophisticated and document. I th- and I think for anybody watching this, um, and perhaps even if you study it or you study other other HEMA sources, it's incredibly important to reiterate that this is the earliest book we have, and yet it shows something very complex already, like at the beginning. It's not like we see... Okay, we, you could argue we see some degree of evolution in the way that uh, fencing sources were put into books and explained. Okay, we do when we get into the when we get into the later we get sixteenth, seventeenth century. It, it, it seems certain that they have more codified ways of explaining things, or at least more universal ways of explaining what certain cuts are called, what certain guards are called, how you teach it, how you represent it in a book, but. I-33 is super complex, okay? Uh, And if that's the earliest source we have, it dates to around 1300. There's some debate whether it's before 1300 or after 1300, but about 1300 AD. So it's the beginning of the 14th century, end of the 13th century. And it shows sword and buckler combat very with a lot of complexity. Ergo, it's the first written source that survived, almost certainly like no chance the chances are that it's the first written source that was ever made are like zero i think it's just the first one that survived it's the the earliest known survivor there must have been earlier sources than that Uh, it tends to indicate the level of sophistication in this um honestly we don't see this degree of sophistication at least for 100 years if you want to look at the fiore manuscripts um but realistically, some of the but, fencing. But we concepts. don't have anything. But we don't have anything. You go from you go from I thirty three and thirteen hundred, and then you've got you've got uh, Dobringer or the the earliest Lichtenauer uh, lineage sources and Fiore around thirteen ninety fourteen hundred, and that's it. So you, so you've got a jump of a hundred years basically. You've got I thirty three, then you've got a hundred years before you get anything else, uh, and <laughs> and you know for uh, it, all the evidence suggests that whatever existed before I-33, whether it was written or verbal, whether it was just an oral tradition that was passed down from uh, teacher to student. Frankly, as most martial arts are, okay, most martial arts don't make books, even today, because you don't need to. If you've got lots of students and you're teaching students, they're your books. You don't need to make books for people who don't know you. Discipline. Yeah. Um, so it's, making books is weird. It's outside of the norm. Okay, it's not normal. Lichtenauer lineage seems to have a particular obsession with making books. But other lineages we know existed didn't have an obsession with making books. Well, and examine the least in our uh, manuscripts. They are largely hodgepodged. Uh, some of them are structured around the, the least in our settle. Uh, and many of them are not, however. They're just sort of slap-dashed together. There's no clear underlying pedagogical structure in them until, you know, really until Meyer, I guess, uh, mm-hmm. Joachim Meyer. So, um, so my, my, my assertion, sorry to jump in, but my, just to keep it with the previous point before you move on to, like, my assertion would be that I-33 represents a, an established, organised system that had probably been passed down for generations, re- perhaps unchanged or relatively unchanged. Who, who knows how far back? Now, the question we get into there is when did sword and buckler appear as a thing? And as far as my uh, studying of medieval art is concerned, the sword and buckler became an incredibly common sidearm set in civilian life and military life, but particularly in civilian life, in the 13th century. Okay? So it could be that we have about a century of tradition leading to I-33. Right, and don't forget, there's, uh, we don't really know where or why buckler appeared. But, you know, these are crusading days, and there are a lot of buckler systems uh, in, you know, the Middle East. North Africa and the Middle East, yeah, yeah. So there's there's conjecture, and I think there's some merit to the conjecture, although not proven, that maybe the buckler was even borrowed from conquests abroad. and brought I mean, home it is interesting to know. I mean, so we have treatises from Persia, from Turkey, Ottoman Empire, and from uh, the Mamluk Mamluks. lands in, in Egypt. And... In all of those cases, they were using a sword with a buckler, and all of the earliest treatises that we have surviving to us from those traditions are also about the same type of time as I-33. They're about 1300. They also have a similar um, illustrative layout. 
Yeah. Uh, with, you know, the over and under images. Yeah, yeah. Uh, typically four characters per page, although many on horseback, especially in the Mamluk. So there could be some interrelation there of the fact that, you know, suddenly these personal combat, rather than Vegetius type of military treatises, where you're talking about armies as a whole, um, uh, rather these kind of the medieval mindset, personal combat, almost dueling uh, treatises, interestingly, start to appear about the same time in North Africa and the Middle East and Europe, which is the 14th century. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe, <laughs> maybe 13th century at the earliest. But in terms of the system itself, I think that we can confidently state that I-33 is a 13th century system because it wouldn't spring into being in the year 1300. It must have had some lineage behind it. No, the, the level of detail... Uh, the complexity of technique alone mm. um, and the structure behind it clearly indicates that there was a lot of thought into this and that's not something some guy slapped together over an afternoon. No. Um, there were clearly there was clearly a team of, of, of constructors for the manuscript uh, in terms of illustrators, in terms of scripters, in terms of writers and presumably advisors. If they mm. were not the same men, they may or may not have been. Um, the, the so a team put this together, mm. and and it's like I said, it's self-referential, and the, the sophistication, the pedagogical sophistication uh, of this, we don't we don't see for another hundred years at minimum uh, surviving. Yeah. Uh, so you don't just sort of like that's not a first draft of how I make a fencing book. Yeah. Right. By no means. So we talked about the context of I-33. I think that's, there are many other things we could say. Some people would want us to look at, is there a relationship to older sword and shield combat and stuff like that? I know there are people out there trying to reconstruct sword and shield use. For example, the center bossed gripped shield from the, the Viking era. Is there a relationship to I-33? We don't know. We're going to leave that. That's a whole big topic. Uh, can of worms. We're just going to leave that for now. In terms of I-33, so... I've never studied that source, but I've been good friends for many years with a number of people who do. There's you, there's David Rawlings over at London Longsword Academy. There's various other people Frank we know. Sonato. Frank Sonata, mm. Roland Vorchek. There's various oh. people out there. Colin Richards has done a bit. And, okay. uh, yeah. so, so various people out there have done a bunch of stuff. And even Oz, actually, in the early days. Martin Ostwick of English. The Emma guys in Toronto have been looking at So it loads of people have worked with this source. Uh, with varying conclusions, varying results, what are some general things in your mind which characterise this system? Is it a is it a is it a balanced cut and thrust system? Does it um, it doesn't have much grappling close in stuff in it? It's got a tiny bit. It's got some, yeah. Yeah, it's got a sum. Um, is it a is it a civilian dueling system? Is it? <clears throat> I mean, I, I, so when this question comes up, I often feel in this period there's no real difference between civilian sword use, military sword. It's just how to use a sword. Yeah. It's the military sword. There's no division yet between civilian swords and military swords. There's just swords. The way I guess I would articulate this from the other angle, I would say there's nothing really to suggest that it's a military source in terms of structure. So you've got a monk. For anyone who doesn't know, the teacher is a sacerdot. Uh, no, no. A cleric, okay. Uh, okay, so lots of people have said things about, oh, he could be a retired soldier and blah, blah, blah. Well, he might be, he might not be. I actually don't think that's very important. We'll never know, and it's not that important. The it, point is, he's someone who knows how to use a sword. It's clearly someone who knows how to use a sword, but there's nothing in the manuscript to suggest military association. But it doesn't really matter Where do old knights period. go yeah. to retire? Probably the church. So but my view is it doesn't really matter because, you know, you take Fiore, for example, someone who we actually know things about biographically, and he was he a soldier? Well, it's kind of a... No, predominantly, he was a fencing teacher. He was a yeah. civilian. He says that he fought five duels. We know that he saw military service in the sort of civil war that was going on and that he was possibly a captain of artillery or, uh, or crossbows. The translation's a bit vague. Uh, but predominantly... What we know about him is that he was a fencing teacher. But we do know that he taught knights. But we do also know that he taught people who never saw military service. The point is, it's irrelevant. He knew how to use a sword. He taught people how to use a sword. And that's what this sacerdos yeah, does. This, look, it, it, whatever it shows, it shows interpersonal uh, combat with, between mm. two people using sword and buckler. Out of armour. It references... Wearing clothes. It, it references what it calls, you know, the guards of the common fencer or the plays of the common fencer. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems to indicate and suggest 
There are other systems that uh -huh. are, of course, less good. So that's a very important point, because there are so many traditions, whether we look at the Lichtenau tradition, whether we look at the I-33 tradition, or if we look at, uh, you could say Fiore when he talks that he studied with various masters and then uh, included what he thought was good. Uh, and then we look at Spanish uh, vulgar, uh, vulgar fencing as opposed to Destreza, you know, the, the kind of royally endorsed fencing. So in many traditions, we see this separation between, oh, this is what we teach. This is the way we do it. We don't do this and that the way that those common fencers do it over there. What in I-33 is the definition of a common... What does a common fencer do that the I-33 fencer doesn't do? Is there a separation? Well, yeah, there is. And so they outline some basic guard positions and say these are the guards of the common fencer. And one of them is just, isn't it Halbschild? No, that's oh. not. Ah, and, and okay. We'll talk, and let's talk about that in okay. detail. This is how little I know about I-33. Well, this is why uh, I think a lot of even 133 guys overlook this key important point. Anyway, the general seven wards of the common fencer are kind of your generic... generic positions where anyone would hold a sword. So whether that means there's guys with structured teaching that hold the sword this way or, you know, Joe Schmo picking up a random sword, these are the at least basic positions they're going to run into. Mm -hmm. um, don't forget numerology and superstitions of the day. You know, number seven is very p important, which is w might be why Half Shield doesn't show up, but we'll get to that in just a second. But I think to answer the question you're really trying to ask is what separates this system from other systems is that there's a clear uh, strategic uh, attitude that when you close, you know, a lot of martial arts, martial arts often talk about the closing because that's the most dangerous part of the fight, mm -hmm. right? When you don't have control of his arms in a non-armor context, um, when you don't have control of their sword in an armed context, that crossing over into that final range is the most dangerous part. So you, you, that's why we look to close with you know binding on a sword and then striking him when we mm -hmm. know the tempo is free and that sort of thing. Um, so when the 133 talks about the closing, uh, they are very firm and consistent that you do so with your sword and buckler together. Uh, here, I'll just use this not accurate sword. <laughs> um, <clears throat> All right, so you're, you're doing it with your sword and buckler closed together to provide protection. Sort of, some people feel in the sense of a... Uh, uh, like a hilt. Like a, like a basket hilt, creating mm -hmm. a basket hilt. Um, but also it facilitates the bind. It makes for a stronger bind because you can bind against... In, in many yeah. situations, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and then they tend to generally work with the sword and buckler together. Yeah. Although that's not entirely true throughout the rest of the manuscript. Is it a bit like, almost like uh, like Wing Chun's sticky hands in a way? It's almost like find the bind and then work from the bind. Um, my understanding of what, uh, sticky hands might be different, so I'm not gonna, I, I, don't, I wouldn't want to make that correlation. Okay. No, I don't think I would do that okay. without some further thought at least. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it is closing under under better protection for your targets that are at the closest range and then as you're coming into range you know then you're separating but now because you have control of their line and their sword and their tempo uh in theory uh you're freer from that position to then separate for your strike okay although it does suggest don't don't do that often but then it also guides you to shield knock and separate to make the hit versus and there seems to be um a fairly clear, I think, the longer you look at the manuscript, the more you tend to agree that the suggestion is other systems don't do this. Uh, and now, you know, when we look at the Bolognese systems, for example, which are admittedly 200 years later, um, they do a lot of single-time actions as well, mm. but they'll do those single-time actions with separations of... Uh, the sword and shield. So they'll parry high and cut low sort of mm -hmm, thing. Mm -hmm. um, they do do some things with hands together, don't get me wrong, but the 133 seems to harp on this as a, a, a an intentional strategy and to stick with it, at least through the closing. So yeah, so my understanding is uh, one of the big differences, so the other big sword and buckler tradition we have is from Bologna in Italy, based on the Dardi tradition. So Dardi was around in the um, uh, 14th century and um, allegedly published some sort of work on the relationship between um, mathematics and fencing. Unfortunately, it's lost. It may turn up one day in Bologna University. It's one of the oldest universities in Europe. It has an amazing library, but apparently terrible organization. And so uh, our friends over in Italy, for example, uh, the guys at Saldam Achille Morozzo, are constantly looking and every now and again discover some new bit of fencing text, which is amazing and exciting, but it's literally hand searching through. But 
the main traditions, so if people are looking at the I-33 tradition and they're looking at, they look at Bolognese, there are some, there are some key differences, aren't there? And um, one of the tradition, one of the biggest to me anyway, as a, as a non-sword and buckler specialist, but who dabbles, um, and I dabble more in the Bolognese stuff, is that the um, sword and buckler are kept separate more in the Bolognese tradition, and in uh, I-33, the two hands seem to spend more of their time together. Um, At least during the closing. Yeah. Um, and certainly the starting guards. I mean, you see, you know, you see the starting guards are often very similar. So you've got an overarm, an underarm. Um, you've got all the same positions as we see in the Italian sword and buckler material. But what happens after that starting position is somewhat different. So we do see some blade-only actions, rabats and stuff sure. in, the, in the Bolognese. Uh, we see occasionally some buckler-only actions um, and separation of, of the sword and buckler to do things, which you see a bit in I-33. It's not that you don't see it at all, but you don't seem to see it as much. No, there seems to be a clear... I-33 seems to have this underlying... That is, they're not explicit in the, in the dialogue, but in the practice, um, there seems to be this clear obsession with managing range uh, incrementally. And so as you're closing with range, the first obsession seems to be to try to get control of their sword. Some bind of some sort so that you can inch a little closer, hmm. um, rather than this cavalier cutting in deep and all that. Now, I say that, but one of the, you know, and they do that through this mechanism they call the obsessios. Uh, the other closing strategy that they seem to favor is entering with a thrust. And that does tend to seem to be uh, you know, but that's aiming. to find the bind, because if you enter with the thrust, the opponent has to bind against it. Correct. So, yeah. so both of their strategies are always about making sure that you've got uh, his sword occupied in the immediate, the first opening tempo, his sword becomes occupied on your sword somehow or another. When you say enter with it, so is that a long point, essentially, you're entering? or lang lang yeah. Yeah, yeah, Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So essentially... So it's kind of what I was saying about the sticky hands thing. If, to me, it feels like you're sort of sticking the sword and buckler out there. You're sticking the buckler out there partially to protect the hand and partially to facilitate a better bind when you find it. And you're sticking the weapon out to try and elicit a reaction from them that you then work from. That you, right, and depending on which manner they take the bind, mm. you know, the, you have a decision tree of mm. if he does this, then do that, and if yeah, he does yeah. that, then do Which this. Which we see in lots of other fencing systems, of right. course. Uh, you know, even even modern foil or even, even, um, even you know, military sabre. Yeah, well, that's another... Uh, so Matt Gallus' term likes the, the expression that this is a ward versus counter ward fencing system. So in other words, if you take up X position, mm -hmm. I take up X, Y position mm. because it limits your options and whatnot, uh, which is... You know, when you when we talk about but then the actual action is dictated by the by the starting to make a movement. Well, and right, like, but as part of that closing, depending on the mechanical positions you're in, and the mechanical oppositions uh, obsessios that I make, mm. uh, I limit your options. Mm. So I either force you into another to change guard to another strategy, yeah. or as I close on you, I limit your options. And that's very sophisticated, especially to be written down so early and so clearly that that's what they're doing. Mm. Um, and you don't really see this, especially this ward counter ward structure, until what? Um, Bendy guy. Uh, well, I don't know. I'd argue you see it in Fury. Well, uh, again, and. But it's not named specifically yeah. ward versus counter ward. I mean, it's a bit different in the Lichtenau lineage because you've got the four, you've got the four core guards, yeah. uh, and then you've got the other additional ones that uh, that aren't the four <clears> core <throat> ones. But in Fiore, in the Italian systems, uh, whether it's Fiore or Vardi, you've got twelve around that number of guards. If you go to the Bolognese material, you've got even more. Uh, well, okay, so you need to distinguish between the Dobringer who says there's only four, yeah. and then the other Lichtenauer guys. Okay, who, I'm not a Lichtenauer guy, but 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 essentially, but you do see the you do see guards opposed to each other in right. Well, in, even in, in the Lichtenauer stuff, you can argue this ward counter ward exists, mm -hmm. but it's not succinctly described in you know in a more professional manner because mm. uh, you know I, I think. I think it was Dave Rawlings and I who had this huge long debate about breaking the guards mm. 
at some point where we talked about this as a, as a concept. Is that really what Breaking the Guards is? Is it mm. Ward Counter Ward? Um, which is another lovely video and discussion, but there you go. Um, okay, well, do you know what we've talked about? Hopefully, this video is obviously aimed mostly at people who don't know much about um, I-33, 133, O-33, Tower Effect book, Valpurgis manuscript, whatever you want to call it, that book, that manuscript anyway. Um, and I hope this has been somewhat interesting as an introduction to it, but it is important, if you didn't know about it, it's important to know about it. It's the earliest European fencing treaties that we have existence of. It clearly, to me anyway, and I think to Scott, indicates that there was a, a, tra a codified tradition of teaching going back, I would say, at least a century before that, probably further. Um, and um, it, it's very, very, it also shows a, a woman fencer, but it's also, it's just a very important source to know about. And it'd be great if more people looked at it and more minds would turn to it, because it's not easy to interpret system, is it? You, you, it's not a beginner's interpretation uh, yeah. system, but it's clearly the best. <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> we're going to finish. Uh, we're going to finish up. But yeah, take a look at I33. You can find some uh, republished facsimiles of it around uh, uh, the Royal Armories uh, has used Dr. Jeffrey Forging's yeah. updated translation. It's really uh, there are other little translations out there, but I think you, you can kind of you can't go wrong with Dr. Forging's translation. Cool. And the Royal Armories has done a lovely reissue. Um, yeah, uh, very high like, quality. Very yeah. high quality, yeah. lovely. Yeah. And it's a beautiful to look at manuscript as well, isn't it? It's, yes. it's, a, it's a beautiful example of art of that period, actually. It's, um, it's not up there with the Renaissance masters, with the Italian Florentine masters or anything like that, but it's for where it's from and for the time it's from, it's really a good work of art. And clearly, I would say, a lot of time and effort and money went into it. Uh, Why? We don't know. Yeah. But there we go. It's another one of the great questions of HEMA history. You could do a whole video on just the flat perspective and the artwork in the yeah. book. It, yeah. It's very interesting. And stuff. the little rosy cheeks that they've got. Yeah, I love yeah, yeah. It. Anyway, thanks for watching, folks, and we'll see you for the next video. Cheers. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.